Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price. His wife, uh, also knowing of it, and brought a certain part and let it, laid it at the apostles' feet. Now this is in uh, contrast, of course, to the episode we read in the last part of the fourth chapter about Barnabas. Uh, we're, we're told in the last verse of chapter 4 that he sold land and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And uh, we're uh, told that a number did this. See, back at uh, 34 and 35, thir uh, 35 begins, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And we had uh, that same type of um, a thing back in the uh, second chapter. And this is the way the Holy Spirit uh, financed the, old, the early church, and it was an opportunity for people to um, believe that, uh, to trust in the fact that God would set up his kingdom on this earth because it was the kingdom that was being offered. All of these people that took this action were Jews, and uh, God had promised to set up a kingdom under the Jewish nation if they would receive the Messiah. And so this is the ultimate in an expression of, um, of faith in that uh, Christ would come. You remember back in the third chapter, uh, Peter promised this. He said that um, in uh, chapter 3, verse 19, Repent, therefore, and be converted, and your sin, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus whom before was preached unto you. Uh, but he said the heavens must receive him, see, in verse 21, whom the heavens must receive until. So Peter is offering the nation of Israel uh, the, uh, the kingdom and the uh, selling of all the goods and laying at the apostles' feet shows that, uh, that they believed or they trusted in the fact that, um, uh, that Christ would come. Now, this individual, we're told, he um, he sold he he let, brought some and put it at the apostles' feet. Verse three. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not yet thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men but unto God. This reminds us of um, um, David's prayer. When he had sinned the sin against uh, Urias, uh, he said that uh, against God he had sinned, against thee and thee only have I sinned. All sin is ultimately against God. But this sin, particularly against the Holy Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit who's directing the... Um, the activity, and by uh, by doing this, uh, he's uh, he's making it seem one thing, and he's uh, and he's doing another. And Peter brings the gravity of his sin before him that this that he's doing is lying to the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, Peter had to have special knowledge from God, or he wouldn't have had any knowledge. He didn't know other than that God let him know. Now. This is another difference between how God was operating at that particular time and how he operates now. We uh, pointed out that uh, the early chapters of Acts is not the place to pattern your activities. He's not financing the church like he financed the operation then. It's not uh, God's directive today to sell all your possessions and come and lay them at the feet of whoever uh, brought you to Christ. And uh, we're going to come across a number of things in this chapter which should help us to understand that it was just not God's plan that we pattern after this. And yet, as we pointed out, there's just a lot of preaching on the radio that uh, uh, we ought to be doing just like they did in the early chapters of Acts. 
We want to do want to point out this thing in this though in the New Testament there are listed at least some seven sins against the Holy Spirit. Two of them are enumerated here in this chapter. He speaks of lying to the Holy Spirit, and then later in the ninth verse he's going to speak of tempting the Holy Spirit. There would be some difference uh, between the two, and, and Ananias and his wife Sapphira committed both of those sins. Uh, to lie to the Holy Spirit is to say that you're doing something for God, which is less than you're doing, to claim to be doing something uh, under his power and under his might. And you see, it was only by the power of the Spirit of God that people would uh, come and lay their possessions down and so forth. And so they were uh, claiming to be under this directive, and obviously their activity shows show that they weren't. But to tempt the Spirit of God is to presume upon his uh, uh, his acquiescence or his, uh, his mercy uh, to do something you know is wrong, saying, well, God, the gracious God, and he'll forgive me anyway. That's a presumptuous sin, and it's uh, tempting the Spirit of God. Uh, you remember, this is the one of the temptations that Christ had, and he quoted uh, a verse, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And uh, this is uh, one of Satan's tricks to cause us to put God to the test. Well, let's just see if God will do what he says he will do. Let's try him and see. And so these two sins they were guilty of. And we said those, those are two of seven sins against the Holy Spirit that are enumerated in the, uh, in the New Testament. In the Gospels, of course, we have the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And in... Uh, uh, in the seventh chapter of Acts, we're going to find in Stephen's sermon, he's going to speak of resisting the Holy Spirit. In uh, the book of Ephesians, we're told to grieve not the Holy Spirit. In uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it's quench not the Spirit. And in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29, uh, there's a warning that not to despise the Holy Spirit or do despot as it, uh, uh, in other words, uh, 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 despise the workings of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of these uh, sins are committed only by unsaved people and some by only by saved people. For instance, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a sin whereby uh, a religious leader knowingly attributes the power of God to the power of Satan. And uh, that's the sin that said we'll receive no forgiveness in this world or the world to come. And the reason it won't receive any forgiveness is because all of the power to convict of sin comes from the Holy Spirit. And if, if, if somebody denies his power, there's no way to be saved. That is to say, uh, the, the uh, Holy Spirit's operation in the world today is to convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus said this back in the 16th chapter of John on the night before he was crucified. So uh, someone who knows that it's the work of the Holy Spirit and for some type of selfish gain or something, he says, that's the work of the devil. And that's what those religious leaders did they knew that, that no, no power but God could do uh, what was being done by Christ. But they didn't want to lose their uh, power or their prestige with the people, and so they tried to ascribe it to, de to the devil. Well, you see, he, uh, Jesus said, look, you can blaspheme the Father and get by with it, and you can blaspheme the Son and get by with it. Uh, but if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, uh, th there's no forgiveness in this world or the world to come because repentance only comes through the work of the Holy Spirit. No other way. Nobody has ever repented except by the uh, convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God. And so if I reject his work and I ascribe it to Satan, there's, there's no way I could get saved. And so the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a work, uh, is a sin of an unsaved person. If you're saved, You've never blasphemed the Holy Spirit, and you never will, because it's a sin committed only by unsaved religious leaders. That's, that's who does that, or someone who does it for uh, 
religious reasons. Then, um, taking these one at the time, as they appear uh, in the Bible, that, uh, that you can find in Matthew chapter 12, beginning with the 31st verse, and then we have this matter of lying to the Holy Spirit, and uh, this brings us to the controversial point as to whether or not Ananias and Sapphira were saved. And the, uh, uh, one of the reasons, not the only reason, the one of the reasons that I say they were saved is that uh, it, uh, it probably is not, it, that probably terminology would not be used lying to the Holy Spirit because if the Holy Spirit did not indwell one, it, somebody, they wouldn't have the opportunity, so to speak, to lie uh, to him against his teaching, in other words. That's one of the things which would lead us to believe that Ananias and Sapphira were saved people. We'll get into that a little more, but usually uh, they're uh, described as unsaved people. But as we go along, we'll, we'll discuss that. And the next thing is tempting the Holy Spirit. And we said this is putting God to the test or... Uh, or saying, well, God has said so-and-so, now let's see if he'll do what he said he'd do. That's putting God to the test. Or uh, that's one uh, way of uh, tempting the Holy Spirit. Another would be like Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they say, well, uh, they knew that the, the Spirit of God was working uh, among these people, and they said, well, we, are, we know he's the one that's supposed to be guiding, but we'll do it our way. Then... Um, we have the matter of resisting the Holy Spirit, Acts 7.51, and that would be ascribed to unsaved people. Uh, when the Holy Spirit of God is calling one to salvation and that one resists the Holy Spirit, that would be resisting his attempt to bring us to salvation. That also would ultimately end in... Uh, being a sin that would never be forgiven if you if you didn't persist I mean if you persisted in it but there's a difference between blasphemy and uh, and resistance blasphemy you see is to deliberately try to lead someone else into a wrong belief where resisting is simply not yielding to the wooing of the Holy Spirit then uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30 uh, we know that that's speaking of saved people when it says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit, because it goes on to say, By whom you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The context would let you know that it's only saved people that can grieve the Holy Spirit. And you grieve him when you will not permit him to do his work within you. That is to say, uh, he's a Holy Spirit. And when, when, he, when there's sin in our lives, and he points out that sin, whether it be the sin of unbelief or sin of lack of trust or whatever, uh, he is grieved because he is the perfect teacher and he was sent to live within us and to teach us. And when we will not be taught of him, uh, we, we grieve him. So he's grieved by our failure to yield to him and let him do that work which he would do within us. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says quench not the spirit now you quench the spirit when you permit when you don't permit permit him to do that which he would do through you uh, he's grieved when you won't permit him to do that which he would do within you you quench him when you will not permit him to do that which he would do through you he does his work in the world today or Jesus Christ uh, through the Holy Spirit of God, does his work in the world today uh, by human agency. And he uh, uh, empowers us to do certain things for him, and he directs us to do those things. When we don't yield ourselves to the doing of those things, we quench the Spirit. So again, he's grieved when we do not permit him to have his proper work within us, and we quench him when we are not permitting him to have his proper work through us. And then in Hebrews 10, 29, it speaks of despising the work of the Spirit. And this is a sin that someone commits, a saved person who has gone on with the Lord and been a servant of the Lord and has uh, experienced uh, the matter of being empowered and being used by God. And then they turn back in the sin for selfish reasons. Uh, this is uh, the sin that's described in, in that passage in Hebrews 10 where it says, 
for if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, and that word for knowledge is epinosis, which means full knowledge, uh, or the epitome of knowledge, the height of knowledge. If we sin willfully after that we have received full knowledge, uh, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, but a fearful looking forward, a fiery indignation that shall devour the adversary. That is to say, we will be turned over to Satan, as Paul says, for the destruction of the body, so that the spirit might be saved in that day. Uh, so, doing despot to the Holy Spirit is a sin of a saved person. Quenching the Holy Spirit is a sin of a saved person. Grieving the Holy Spirit is the sin of a saved person. Now, resisting the Holy Spirit is uh, uh, the sin of an unsaved person. That doesn't mean to say that uh, you, a saved person, uh, is not able to, to resist the Spirit, but it's called, when you resist this, when a saved person resists the Spirit, it's called quenching or else grieving. It's different. Uh, so, this, uh, resisting the Spirit as we have it in the seventh chapter of Acts is, um, is um, an action against the Spirit by an unsaved person. So then we have to review again these two actions against the Holy Spirit that we have in um, Acts chapter 5, lying to and tempting. Now we'll go uh, along with this now and see if we can come to a, a better conclusion of just what this story is all about. Verse 5 of chapter 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost or died, and great fear came on all of them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in and Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much? And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to try or tempt the Spirit of the Lord Behold, the feet of them who have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Now, I don't believe that there's anybody today uh, claiming to follow the pattern of the New Testament who will prophesy someone's immediate death. Now, here was a completely well person that uh, uh, was able to walk into his presence, and uh, he told her, your husband has just died, and the ones that have carried his body out are going to carry your body out. In other words, he was predicting the immediate death of a live person. I don't know anybody that can do that today, and, and it'll hold up. Uh, now, because God is not operating in the way he operated in. And for us to presume today that we have exactly the same powers as God gave to those apostles is, is presumptuous. And yet, I hear it all the time. And there's just nobody that has this power. God's not giving it today. It's not part of his operation uh, to tell somebody. Now, Peter was saying this by the power of the Spirit of God. And uh, there's people today that obviously in, in impede God's work do on the face of it at least worse than Ananias and Sapphira did. And uh, yet you don't see them immediately struck dead. Now God, I believe today, brings about the demise of persons <coughs> who uh, just uh, will not uh, do other than obstruct his work and he moves them out of the way so he can go ahead and do his work. But he has other ways of doing it. He doesn't have some spokesman of his tell that person uh, in about two seconds you're going to drop dead. He doesn't, he doesn't do that today. And so uh, one of the reasons he did it then was to help us to try to understand that his operation is not the same. And when we quote Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever in, uh, in some of the activities we have had, we're just misusing uh, that scripture. He is the same, but he doesn't operate the same. And this, this should uh, help us to understand that. Uh, well, let's read on here and see if we can gather some more information from this. 
Verse 10. Then fell she down immediately, right then. He said, you're going to die, and she died. Uh, immediately did Stephen died, and the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying uh, her forth, buried her by her husband, and great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Now, the language tells me that these people were saved people, a part of the church. Peter obviously knew whether they were saved or went, whether they weren't. And uh, if if he had uh, informed these people that they weren't saved, well, then uh, it wouldn't have had the same effect on them because they would have been looked upon as interlopers. Now, the other thing is, this is almost an exact pattern of what happened in the seventh chapter of the book of Joshua. If you remember, God was starting a new program. Uh, his children, his people had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and now he was going to bring them into the promised land that they might be used to do a certain work. And that the, the book, the early chapters of the book of Joshua parallel the early chapters of the book of Acts. Because, and, and there are many ways in which the two books parallel. And because Achan was covetous and uh, held something for himself that belonged to God, that uh, God brought about his immediate demise and then his whole family, for that matter. Now, uh, uh, it, that happened to Ananias even though he repented. He says, I've sinned. I've sinned against God. Uh, and yet, uh, he, was, uh, he was put to death. And uh, the reason he was put to death was uh, a sign to the rest of the people that when God has some special action to do, some program to carry on, well, he's not going to let a human being stand in his way. Now, you might say, and I, I read quite a lot of comment about the, on this Ananias and Sapphira business, and some of it, I tell you, I'd be afraid to say what some of them say. Some of them actually blame God, or, or, or uh, they usually blame Peter, and uh, saying, "Well, Peter had no business to pronounce these people uh, to put his uh, his curse on them, so to speak, when he had all this power from God. He they had no right to do that without giving them any right to repent or anything, you know. Well, what Peter did, he did under the direct control of the Spirit of God. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't think that up. And so when you're criticizing what Peter did here, you're, you're just telling God he's wrong. Now, uh, it may not seem fair to us, but let's just stop about uh, think about it for a minute. Let's suppose Ananias and Sapphira first were saved people. Let's suppose they were saved. Well, they had ruined any opportunity to earn heavenly rewards and be used at all. And so it was better for them to be taken out of the way. And uh, if, if they were saved people, uh, whether they stayed on earth a while or not had nothing to do with where they were going to spend eternity. Or let's suppose they weren't saved. If they weren't saved, God would have known whether or not they would have responded to repentance, and God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a knowledge of the truth. And if God had foreknown that they would have repented, and would have been acceptable members of his family. Uh, he could have handled it in a different way, but he chose to handle it in a way which was wise and judicious concerning all the situation. And he knew what the situation was, and we don't. I mean, we certainly, we might, we know some of the facts upon reflection, but he knew what was best. And listen, human beings have always been expendable in God's program as far as their existence on this earth is concerned. Now, uh, a human soul is an eternal thing, and God lives in an eternal co uh, uh, economy. And he doesn't have to worry about whether or not somebody gets a raw deal. I'm not saying these people did, but if, even if they did. God doesn't have to worry about whether or not somebody gets a raw deal in this life. He has all of eternity to make that up. He's got that all settled in his mind beforehand. And it's just our little small mind, small inability to comprehend him and his marvelous ways that cause us to think that the way he did it was wrong. But I'll assure you that this is exactly what happened, and I'll assure you 
it was handled exactly right, just exactly like it should have been, and it had the desired results. Now, it is rather interesting to note, again, over in chapter 4, that um, verse 29, they prayed, and now, Lord, behold, their threatenings, grant us, here's a prayer, grant us, thy servants, that with all boldness that we may speak thy word. And then in verse 30, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done uh, by the name of the holy child Jesus. Now, uh, notice verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. They asked there for this boldness of speech, and then they asked for signs and wonders. Then we're told that they had the boldness to speak, and then, then this story comes in, and then we go on with uh, with things as they were were supposed to be. Uh, look at verse twelve. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in, in Solomon's porch. Now, they were uh, in in verse thirty two of, of chapter four, and the multitude of those that believed were of one heart and one soul. They were of one accord, then they were out of one accord. Uh, and uh, Ananias and Sapphira certainly weren't in one accord with the rest of them, were they? Because all the rest of them were bringing everything and putting it at the apostles' feet. And these two didn't. They weren't in one accord, were they? And so things just couldn't go on until everybody got in one accord again. Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, after we had this little episode with Ananias and Sapphira, they were back in one accord. So at least... We'll have to admit, regardless of whether or not we think God handled it right, we'll have to admit that uh, they went from one accord uh, to out of one accord and back to one accord. That sure happened, because that's the, that's the testimony here. And then God's in a position to go ahead and answer the rest of the prayer. He couldn't answer the rest of the prayer until this episode got taken out. Now, God could see their hearts. Uh, their fellow Christian, they didn't know. Peter didn't know. And as you see, all through here, I've treated this as though Ananias and Sapphira were saved people. I fully understand that most evangelical scholars would say they were not saved. And so if you don't think they were saved, you, you're in the majority as far as the company's concerned. And so I don't feel hard at you for not wanting to be with, with this little small minority here that, uh, that uh, believes that they're saved people. But I have every confidence in the world and when I get to heaven, I'm going to be able to talk this over with these two people personally and get their thoughts on it from that viewpoint uh, because I, I'm, I'm confident from all the language we have here that they're saved people, these two people. And they fit into the same... I'll show you the category they fit into. Uh, hold your place in Acts and turn over to 1 John chapter 5. Verse 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin, now this is talking about saved people. See, it just got through uh, verse, well, let's start with verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask him anything according to his will, he heareth us, and we know that he will hear us if we know they have the petitions asked of him. This is all language to a saved people. See, verse 13, these things have I written unto you that believe. It's to a believer. And it says, If any man of you see a brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall, he shall ask him, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin not unto death. I do not uh, say there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. So uh, there is a sin that a brother can sin that's unto death. Now, this doesn't mean the second death in hell. It means the physical demise of the person. And this is not the only uh, instance of that. Uh, there's an instance in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when we get there of some that lost their lives because they were misusing the Lord's Supper. And uh, Paul said of this man in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, he said, um, Deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh the spirit might be saved in that day so these people had committed the sin unto death uh, there are other aspects of the sin unto death but the sin unto death 
is a sin committed by a saved person. That is not the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is sometimes called the unpardonable sin. Because every sin, there's a difference between pardon and, and uh, forgiveness. Uh, you see, we've been pardoned for all of our sins, those of us that are saved. But uh, we receive forgiveness based on our repentant spirit. So, uh, and I realize that in the Bible the term forgiveness is used in a, a narrow uh, sense and in a broad sense, so uh, don't uh, judge me harshly there by the way I use that. But there is a sense in which we're pardoned for some sins, but we are not uh, forgiven till we confess, if you see what I mean. That's in relationship to our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, uh, righteousness we're told. So, the unpardonable sin, so to speak, which is the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, is a sin committed by an unsaved person. A sin unto death is a sin that's committed by a saved person. And uh, one person's headed for hell and the other is headed for heaven having lost all of his uh, heavenly status or heavenly rewards. To confuse these two is to just uh, con confuse the whole issue. Back to Acts 5, verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. They're still using the temple there. And of the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Now here's another uh, benefit from this sin of Ananias and Sapphira. You see, when Jesus was here, he says, Offenses must needs come, but woe unto him by whom the offense cometh. And in another place, let's see if I can find that in, in 1 Corinthians. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 19, For there must be also heresies among you for a purpose, that they who are approved may be made manifest among you. And there's a, there's a similar verse in uh, 1 John chapter 2. You don't have to run all these down with me if you don't want to. Uh, in uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that uh, they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And that, those are, that's speaking about unsaved people that gathered themselves together with God's people but uh, weren't really saved. And uh, one of the advantages that this operation with Ananias and Sapphira had, unbelievers were afraid to, um, to be identified with God's people. In other words, you just didn't have anybody uh, making a false profession. Uh, it should be obvious to us the, the big problem with the church today is we've let so many of the enemy into the camp till the enemy runs the camp. And uh, uh, it's the, the church, almost any local organized church, or I won't say almost any, but a great majority of them are a mixture of saved people and unsaved people with more unsaved people than there are saved people. And that's because... Uh, for whatever reason, uh, they join together with the Christians, but they're not saved. Well, what this verse is saying, that the people who weren't really saved were afraid to, to uh, put up a pretense. And the rest, there's no man join himself to them, but the people uh, manif uh, magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both men and women, didn't keep the true believers from, from joining up with them. 15, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the, at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came uh, also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem bringing sick folks and 
them who were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now, there again, whenever Jesus healed, or whenever anyone was healed during the period of miracles in the early church, here was the, the pattern. Every single person was healed first that came for healing. Every one. Not one missed. Whether they had faith or not, everybody was healed that came for healing. Everybody was healed. Number two is, they were all healed completely instantaneously. Or that's two and three. The healing was always instantaneous, right on the spot, immediate, no question. And it was always complete. No relapsing back or no halfway or no gradual over a period of the next month or something. It was always immediate, a hundred percent of the time. That was the complete pattern. Now, I don't know of anybody, I don't know of a single a person who claims the gift of healing today that also claims that every single person that ever comes to them with any infirmity whatsoever is always healed completely instantaneously. I don't know if anybody even claims that. And uh, so that should show us again, the pattern is not the same. The operation of God is not the same. And we're not to claim to have the same powers in the same way that was possessed by the servants in the early chapters of Acts. And yet, there certainly is a lot of people making the claim. But to make the claim, they have to ignore so much of the pattern and just pick out certain things and say, I'm patterning this, patterning this after, and just throw out everything else. But God put these, this type of language in there for a purpose. They were healed, every one. Uh, hold the place here a moment and look in Matthew chapter 8. I heard a sermon on the radio just, just recently, and it was using the case of the healing of, of um, Peter's mother-in-law. And, uh, and the fellow told of a, a similar instance, just like when Jesus came and took her by the hand, and he was telling about his episode, and he ended by saying, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, now let's just read this, uh, Matthew eight fourteen. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's, wife's mother lying sick of the fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose and administered unto him, all of them. And then the evening was come, they brought her, brought unto him many that were possessed of demons, and he cast out the spirits with his word, and healed all that were sick. A-L-L. -L, all that were sick. Now, you'll see that as a pattern. Nothing gradual. Uh, now, I'm sure that today, God in his mercy, tends to mend some of our bodies uh, that are injured or sick or something with more rapidity than uh, would seem to be uh, the case, the usual case. Uh, the, um, what I was just by to see my doctor yesterday, and uh, he said, and we are talking about my situation, and he says, well, my progress at the end of six weeks is what he would normally have expected at the end of several months, eight, uh, five or six months. Well, uh, sorry with me if, if uh, my praying friends uh, uh, attribute that to God. I, I, I think that's great, you know, and uh, uh, I appreciate the prayers of those uh, that have prayed for me. And uh, God can heal in many ways. He can heal instantaneously, and he does. He can heal gradually, and he does, and he can heal uh, with techniques and so forth. And um, however it suits his purposes. But what I'm saying is that I, I'm, not, I'm not 
saying that, that God does not heal gradually. What I'm saying is that in every instance where healing took place in the Gospels by the hand of Jesus Christ and in the book of Acts at the hands of the servants of God, in every instance, the healing was spectacular, it was instant, it was 100%, it was a complete healing, every instance. And I'm simply saying is that God's program today is not the same. That's all I'm saying. And that when we try to make it the same, that's when we end in, in confusion. Verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the prison. Common prison. Now we're going to come right into something else that's not the pattern for our day. But an angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words uh, of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and, uh, that, the, and they that were with them called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now, that just doesn't happen today. You have, uh, I don't mean that God uh, has lost any of his power to open jails. He opened one for Paul and Silas in the 16th chapter, but he didn't go back and close the doors. You see, these people were brought out of jail without ever having the doors unlocked. The doors stayed locked. You're going to have a similar situation uh, in the 10th chapter uh, where an angel came. And God just isn't doing that today. He's not sending angels to get people out of prison without ever disturbing the locks. That's never happened. I, I don't even believe this. Anybody with any kind of validity will claim. Now, I've, I've heard all kinds of stories of people being released miraculously from prison and such as I. I don't know whether they believe them or not. But I've never heard a single one of them say that they got out of the prison with the door still locked after they got out. Gave them some instructions while he was letting them out. Now, in this case, an angel came, got them out of jail, left the jail locked, and all the guards still there. And then the angel gave them some instructions and, and told them what to do. He said, go stand and speak. I submit to you that God's program is not operating in that way today and has not. Well, um, but he did then. Boy, I believe it happened just, just like it says here. I believe it happened just exactly like it says. Verse 24. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, uh, they were perplexed concerning them how this uh, would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in, in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain and the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should uh, have been stoned. In other words, the apostles went with them willingly. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked, uh, asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intended to bring this man's blood upon us. Now these same people, just a few weeks previously, had said, let his blood be on us and on our children. Now, uh, hold your place here for a moment and uh, look back in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 25. Then answered all the people, and said, His blood be on us and our children. 
Uh, these, this was the multitude there before Pilate being led by the religious leaders when they had Barabbas and uh, Jesus both before Pilate there. And now they're complaining that uh, the apostles are trying to uh, put the blood of Christ on them. Well, they sure are. Uh, look back in uh, 2.23, chapter 2, verse 23. Peter preaching. Him being delivered by the determined foreknowledge of God, uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken. He's talking to the, to the people of, you see, verse 22, ye men of Israel. He says in verse 23, the last phrase, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And then in verse 36, uh, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And then in 3.14, But you denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder to be granted unto you, and kill the Prince of Life. See, he's blaming it, putting it right on their, their shoulders. In chapter 4, verse 10, Be it known unto you, and to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus, of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God has raised up. And then, here in, uh, so, uh, they're right when they say that Peter was accusing them. Now, they didn't like it here. They thought it was great uh, a few weeks previously. So, Peter, uh, he responds, verse 29, and Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom we slew and hanged on a tree. <laughs> I mean, he's, uh, he, he's not denying it at all when, uh, when they accuse him of... Uh, see, they're saying, Look, you're, you're, you're saying we're guilty of the death of Christ. And he's saying, Yeah, that's right. That's what I'm saying. Verse 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Now, it's well for us to notice again that all of these sermons that are being uh, preached, everything we've heard here so far is addressed to Israel as a nation. And he says, that, that Christ is now exalted out of the right hand of God for the purpose of giving repentance to Israel. He's not offering salvation to any and everybody. He's offering a message to Israel. We've seen that again and again and again. And here's another reason why we shouldn't use these as our pattern because that's not our message today. We're not offering repentance to Israel as a nation. The reason Peter was is because he was giving the nation of Israel the opportunity to be used of God to establish the kingdom. But they rejected that, so God is now doing something different in different ways than he was doing then. Verse 32, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Verse 33, When they heard that, they were cut uh, to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Now we're going to have a performance by a gentleman named Gamaliel. And this fellow is somebody that uh, Paul said was his principal teacher. He said he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And uh, I, read, I read quite a bit of comment about Gamaliel, and he's generally commended for what he did here. That this was wise counsel. And... Uh, uh, I mean, in, in evangelical commentaries. Well, I just don't cotton up to Gamaliel at all myself. I don't find anything worthy of uh, uh, compliment in this action. I suppose most of them join hands with him because it looks like he saved the lives of the apostles, but he didn't. Let's go on and read about it now that uh, we see... I think I think Gamaliel was a uh, uh, strictly a fence setter. 
who's just like a uh, present-day politician that sits right up there on the fence trying to make everybody believe whichever side of the fence you're on, he's, he's trying to convince you that he's just ready to jump on your side. He, he's on the side, on, he's on the fence saying, look, I know I was over there, but now on your side, you see, and trying to, to satisfy both sides. And uh, this is what Gamaliel looks like to me. Verse 34. Then, uh, there, then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. And uh, this word that he was a teacher, it says he was a doctor, it means a teacher, of the law, held in reputation among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. In other words, bring them up here to me. I want to uh, talk to you about them. And said unto them, that is the listeners, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourself what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up uh, Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom uh, a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, and who were slain and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this, after this man rose up Judas of Galilee, uh, in the days of Taxon, and uh, drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, let them alone. For if this counsel, or this work, be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, uh, lest peradventure ye be found, found to even fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now I'll tell you why I don't see anything commendable about this at all. In the first place, the counsel that he's given is not wise. He's taken two instances. He said, look, here's two different leaders that rose up, and in no time at all, uh, their work went for naught. And so if these men are uh, preaching something that really isn't true, it's going to come to nothing anyway. So don't worry about it. Well, you see, that's just not so. There's, they, they had the Sadducees and the Pharisees been going on for generations. And uh, they were teaching false doctrine, and they didn't come to naught in the next uh, few weeks, so they'd been around a long time. So that's not necessarily so. The... Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have not come to naught, and uh, they will one day, of course. And uh, the uh, Mormons and all of these other false leaders and doctrines and so forth. So what he's saying here is not necessarily so. And the other thing is, he says they might be speaking the words of God, and you'd be fighting against God. And after he says this, then he lets them beat them and tells them not to speak in the name of Jesus. And he just got through saying they might be speaking from God, which they were, of course. Uh, uh, it, to me, it, he's just about as inconsistent as a, as a guy could be. If they might possibly be speaking from God, you better not beat them and tell them not to do it anymore, had you? And yet his, his counsel is, uh, if you, if you uh, are against these fellows, you may find yourself against God. But it's all right to beat God and tell God not so to speak and tell God not to speak what God wants to speak. See, that to me, that's just... Uh, uh, the wisdom of man, certainly not the wisdom of God. So I don't, uh, this guy, as far as I'm concerned, just got too much uh, learning without any wisdom. But you say, well, it uh, brought about the release. No, it didn't bring about the release of these men. Uh, but, uh, he didn't get in that jail and get them out, did he? he God didn't need Gamaliel to protect these people. He didn't need them just a few, uh, just a few hours earlier than this. They're in jail. And God managed to get them out. I don't think it really taxed him too much. And, but he got them out. And uh, so uh, God didn't need Gamaliel here to protect these men. He, God's just simply recording here uh, how ineffectual man really is and how mixed up he is. So, uh, I'm not one of Gamaliel's fans, but he's got a lot of fans among some pretty good people. Uh, verse 41. 
And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer, to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. So it didn't do them any good to try to stop them, did it? Now, to me, this is one of those marvelous verses in the Bible where you find rejoicing and suffering in the same verse on the same occasion. This is what marks true, true Christianity, that rejoicing and suffering can come together. I just want to show you a few more of those verses. Let's look uh, back in Luke, if I can find it. I don't have it marked here. It's, let's try. Mm, chapter 7. Um, No, chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and, shall, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast you out, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. See, when you're being persecuted, uh, suffering, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Well, the parallel verse in Matthew is in the fifth chapter. Uh, same, it, it's the same teaching, but it's just the, the Matthew account. And it says in, uh, in Matthew 5.11, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad when you're persecuted. In uh, First Thessalonians, Paul's writing to, to them, and in the first chapter there, he's saying they received their salvation in much tribulation and great joy. So, for a Christian, terrible suffering, great tribulation can come right in the middle of great rejoicing. And this is one of those verses that we have here. Well, the fifth chapter has 42 verses, and we went in the whole chapter in one night. That's uh, pretty fast compared to what we've been doing, isn't it? And uh, this uh, next chapter is going to be chapter 6. And uh, it's only 15 verses. So I don't know how we'll do with that, but that's one of my favorite chapters in the, uh, in the book of Acts. So we'll be doing that next week. Shall we pray? Father, again, we thank you for opening up your word and teaching us uh, what you think about and how you act and how you operate. We pray that we'll take these great truths that we find in the book of the house and put them in the right setting, in the right context, uh, so that we might learn the things you'd have us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen.